Locked in the Tower of London's safe are two extraordinary treasures that only take center stage once every five years. Well, these are the golden keys to the Tower of London. They are real keys. They will actually open the doors of the Tower of London. They're not just um, some little gold icon. They actually function. These unique golden keys lie at the heart of a ceremony that has never been witnessed before by the public. A new leader is about to take over at the tower. These are the keys that I will take up just before we have the installation ceremony, and I will hand them over to the Lord Chamberlain or his representative, and they will then be carried out by the Lord Chamberlain and handed over to the constable as the keeper of the tower. And very difficult to see, but it actually does name on each of the keys. One is for the constable of the tower, and the other one actually says resident governor of the tower. So they each have their own gold key to the Tower of London. These are the personal gold keys of the tower's top brass, the governor and the constable. The constable is the most senior person at the tower. The job is almost as old as the tower itself, stretching back over 900 years. The constable holds the, the Tower of London in the monarch's name. These keys represent the tower and the power that the monarch has within our country. Historically, such an important role as the constable has always gone to one of the Sovereign's most trusted men, including such greats as the Duke of Wellington. Right, here we go. Work hard, give of your best. Tate! Tate! Hold it still. No! Preparations are underway for a new man to take over the keys of the castle. The 158th Constable of Her Majesty's Royal Palace and Fortress, the Tower of London. The title of constable still goes to men who have wielded considerable power. The tower's own gallery of constables shows that since 1784, the position has always been held by a very senior military officer. The outgoing constable is Field Marshal the Lord Inge. Before he took over at the tower, he was Britain's defence chief, in charge of all our armed forces. Now he's the tower's figurehead, his role mostly ceremonial. I've loved my five years as the constable of the Tower of London, I think really for two reasons. First of all, of course, the traditions that exist here at the Tower of London, which are, in my view are very much the part of the fabric of the heritage of our nation. And I'm a great believer in tradition. Tradition can be a sort of handrail to steady you when the going gets rough, and it's a set of standards that are handed down to you, and I think you, one ignores traditions at one's peril. From its earliest days, the tower has stood right next to Britain's richest business district, the City of London. Over the course of nine centuries of history, the buildings have changed, but this is still one of the world's key economic trading centres. So when the tower really mattered in the power politics of Britain, dominating all this wealth from the tallest and toughest fortress in town, made the constable a very powerful man. But with power came responsibility. To be the constable of the Tower of London, and I'm thinking particularly in the Middle Ages here, is a bit of a rotten job to have. You're, you've got to do lots of very important things like guard prisoners, make sure that the place is stocked up with weaponry, and make sure that the royal treasure is safe. 
And in addition to that, everyone hates you in the city of London because you are the king's man and you're always interfering in their lives. To make the job more bearable and remind everyone who was boss, the constable did have certain perks. Most of them involved the great highway that ran right past the tower, the River Thames. In medieval times, this was like the M1 and Channel Tunnel rolled into one, and the constable could collect taxes here. We know that in Richard II's time, the constable had these rights. From every boat carrying mussels to London, a quantity known as a maund is to be left on Tower Wharf. Every boat carrying wine from Bordeaux, one barrel before the mast and one barrel aft. A penny per foot of any animal pasturing in the tower ditch and tuppence from each pilgrim going to the shrine of St James. One armful of rushes shall be left from every boatload. These ancient rites were called the constable's dues. Inevitably, how the constable collected his dues was a frequent flashpoint between the tower and the city. During the reign of Edward II, a king renowned for his bad advisers, relations reached an all-time low. At the Guildhall Reference Library, curator Jeremy Ashby has been researching an extraordinary tale of 14th century skullduggery. What I'm looking at here is a very, very important manuscript called the Liber Customarum, the Book of Customs. This is the original copy, as far as we can see, the earliest copy at the least, of um, a quite extraordinary event in the year 1321, um, a trial which took place inside the Tower of London. King Edward II was disliked by just about everyone, and his constable at the Tower, John de Cromwell, did nothing to help. But now the constable was to be tried in his own fortress for wanton abuse of his power. John de Cromwell emerges as a bit of a pirate. He'd um, made several unprovoked attacks on the city of London to try and seize land, which they'd naturally resented. Um, the Londoners thought that he was um, guilty of arresting people without charge and locking them up in the Tower of London, always something to um, get their backs up. Now the Londoners were out for revenge. John de Cromwell, you were charged that you did illegally impound a ship, the Varkas, laden with tiles, and furthermore, you did steal fish, rushes, oysters, mussels, sprats, red herring, and wood and wine. What have you got to say in your defence? My lord, as far as the Varkas is concerned, I was away with the Lord King at Windsor, working as his steward when that happened. But anyway, my men found the boat just moored up at the wharf. Since no one claimed it, they kept it. The gist of his defence is that it was the right of the constable of the tower to take these um, perquisites. They go with his office and they are a matter of the royal dignity, which is something that he seems to be keen to assert. So whenever he was asked a question, he seems to have made up any answer that he could come to. If in doubt, he waffled. Take from every 500 smelt coming over land, 100 for one penny. As regards the smelt fish... As the trial I went on, the political situation outside worsened. Full-scale civil war threatened London, and the royal family took refuge within the tower. It was under virtual siege conditions that de Cromwell's trial reached its bizarre conclusion. Judgment Day comes, which is this bit of the manuscript here. Um, as it turned out, though, it wasn't quite the judgment that uh, anyone had really expected. Sirs, it doth not appear that our, our friend the constable, John de Cromwell, will appear before us today. And then it gives the reason why. Because he had been dismissed um, as constable of the said tower. Not, as it turned out, for his crimes of piracy, but for something far, far closer to home. Because, eo quod male custodiebat domus turis 
he had so badly maintained the buildings of the Tower of London that it had rained onto the bed of the Queen of England while she was giving birth in it there to a daughter by the name of Joan, who went through her entire life by the name of Joan of the Tower. I think this is one of the um, stranger stories of the Middle Ages that I've ever encountered, and it absolutely is something that you couldn't make up. Despite such a controversial history, nearly 700 years later, dues are still paid to the constable of the Tower of London. But like so many of the Tower's real ancient rites and powers, today all that's left is ritual. A crew from HMS President are on their way to the tower with a wine barrel. It's another chance for the tower to show off its historic past, even if it seems baffling to outsiders. John Kahan, the yeoman jailer, is in charge of preparations. This is the uh, cloth which is actually going to go on the table to receive the uh, constable's dues. Right, let's go upstairs. Going up to get my axe. Come on, lift. Right. John's Tudor axe is about to take centre stage. Right. So I'm put a thin film of oil on. In his home at the Tower of London, Yeoman Jailer John Cahan is getting his badge of office ready for a unique tower ritual. If it does rain on us today. At least it won't go rusty, because I can be able to get it straight back in, get it dried off. And, uh... The jailer's axe goes with him to all tower ceremonies. Chief Yeoman Warder Tom Sharp also has his own ceremonial staff, inscribed with its history. Colours! Out! This is the mace. And that was presented to the chief young warder by the burghers of Tower Hamlets in the 1600s. It's the, the silver uh, model of the White Tower. You can see here's the, the southeast corner with the, uh, the chapel. This is where the chapel of St. John is. Then we have the, uh, the three other turrets. Keep moving down, folks. We're going to have this area clear. This whole area. The tower is hosting what's called the Constable's Dues. Harking back to the ancient rites of the tower's top man to receive payment from ships. Your business, sir. Her Majesty's ship, President, with the constable's dues of wine. Well, follow me. The constable awaits you at the Queen's house. Right, left, quick, march. Today, events like this have more to do with pageantry than politics. The Navy's wine barrel is a small one, and it's empty. This is one of the last official functions of the outgoing constable. Field Marshal the Lord Inge. To the Constable of the Ancient Palace and Fortress of Her Majesty's Tower of London, greeting. Whereas I am Captain of Her Majesty's Ship President, I render due fee of wine to you as Constable with good grace. Uh, thank you, sir, for the handsome discharge of, a, of your dues, and I accept the wine with much pleasure. I suggest that we adjourn to the Council Chamber to refresh ourselves and given the weather as quickly as possible. <laughs> well, of course, it's changed dramatically over the years. If you look at the role of some of my very distinguished predecessors, uh, I mean, they had a very highly charged political role and a very difficult role. If you look like someone, for example, Sir William Kingston, who was the uh, constable during the time of Henry VIII, he not only had to sort of, if you like, handle or oversee the execution of Anne Boleyn, which must have been a very difficult in itself, but of course in the Tower of London at the same time was Sir Thomas More, um, of course who was a personal friend and had, handling his imprisonment and then his execution must have been very difficult. I've had nothing like as tricky as that. Sir William Kingston was so tied up in Henry VIII's efforts to discredit Anne Boleyn that he even placed his own wife as a spy in her chambers. She reported everything she heard back to her husband, so he could help condemn Queen Anne as a traitor. The constable and his family were right at the centre of deadly politics. 460 years later, the 157th constable of the Tower of London has got one last parade, 
a ceremonial leaving party. Field Marshal the Lord Inge actually finishes as constable today. And again. And what we are doing is just forming up uh, with the military guard and saying farewell to him before he goes to Buckingham Palace uh, to visit Her Majesty. The constable has direct access to the monarch uh, because he holds the tower in her name, so he must have direct access to her. Standard. Ace. In a few weeks, the 158th Constable, General Sir Roger Wheeler, will be officially installed. Her Majesty's Tower of London God, Priest Lord Inge leaves the tower for the last time as Constable, on his way to Buckingham Palace for a brief audience with the Queen. Today, such access to the monarch is a mere formality. But when the tower was vital to the control of the country, monarchs ignored the constable at their peril. 400 years ago, relations between the tower and the sovereign reached crisis point. These were the last years of the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. Her glory days were long gone, and she was struggling to keep control of government. But the new boss of the tower, John Payton, urgently needed to grab the aging queen's attention. Since her mother, Anne Boleyn's coronation 60 years earlier, the tower had been neglected. So Peyton commissioned the drawing up of a definitive plan to show Elizabeth just what was going wrong. The earliest copy of that plan shows the dire state of affairs Peyton discovered at the tower. It has recently been re-evaluated by curator Anna Kay. So we know this is a copy of the plan which Peyton commissioned because it actually says made by the direction of Sir John Peyton Knight on it. Peyton's first concern was that Londoners were building houses all over the area closest to the tower, putting its safety in danger. And he says, in premise, the city of London did and does... Present title. title to your majesty's soil of Tower Hill... Peyton was worried that the tower would be impossible to defend if it didn't have control of open land around it. He was warning Elizabeth that squatters were threatening the tower's security by moving onto this crown land. He was also very concerned about the physical condition of the buildings of the tower. To some extent, this is illustrated vividly on the plan, which shows, for example, only the north wall of the Queen's Great Hall still standing, and it actually says on the label, the hall decayed. Peyton wasn't only worried about the state of the buildings, he was also beside himself over the prisoners. The tower was full of Catholic prisoners, who were a threat to Elizabeth's Protestant rule. All prisoners, having liberty of the tower, have continual access to all manner of persons and to them. Despite the risk they posed to the Queen, many of the prisoners, along with their visitors, seemed able to do virtually what they liked, out of poor old Peyton's control. There was a particularly embarrassing incident for Peyton, uh, which happened in the very month he was writing this report. Um, there was a very, very high-profile uh, escape by two Jesuit priests from the tower, from uh, the Cradle Tower here, actually, and they escape over the moat uh, into boats and they disappear off down the Thames. To run the tower successfully always needs the monarch's support. Sadly for Peyton, his pleas to the Queen fell on deaf ears. Elizabeth had far too many other troubles and failed to help. Peyton left the tower with the problems unsolved. He took no happy memories. The tower is composed of nothing but trouble, danger, charge and vexation. Tower legend suggests it isn't only the constable who's responsible for the safekeeping of the tower and the sovereign. The story goes that if the ravens leave, then the tower will fall and the monarchy will crumble soon after. But their loyalty is rarely tested. They've all had their wings clipped. The birds have their own personal yeoman warder, 
Raven Master Derek Coyle. There you go. That's the first of the brothers, Odin's brothers Thor. He's waiting for Thor now, look. You get to know their characters very well. It's just the little traits that they've got. They know exactly what's happening around about them. And they've got that sort of, well, I call it a cheeky look. You know, they, they can be pretty impudent. They're very intelligent. I mean, they need stimulated. Perhaps boy, the Thor. most intelligent of the tower birds is Thor. Good boy. He's learned to mimic Derek. Come on then, good boy. Come on, Thor, good boy. Come on, Ed. Come on. Right, we're going to find Hardy. There he is, look. Good boy, Hardy. Here you are, sunshine. Good boy. Good boy, Hardy. Here you are. There's a good boy. I must admit, if there is a choice piece of meat, I normally save it for him. He probably is my favourite. Good boy. Good boy. Tradition has it that after the restoration of the monarchy, King Charles II decreed that six ravens should be maintained at the tower in order to preserve the kingdom. Today there's seven, one's a spare. The 158th Constable of the Tower of London is about to arrive on site. Chief Yeoman Warder Tom Sharp is waiting to meet his new boss. He's going to introduce him to the Yeoman Warders. Basically, so he gets to know what his Yeoman Warders are like, but probably more important is that the Yeoman Warders need to get to know what he is like, because there's nothing more embarrassing uh, than having the Constable walk into the tower and, and somebody saying, excuse me, who are you? Mr. Humphrey, sir. Oh, is, uh... The new Constable is General Sir Roger Wheeler. He comes from a military family. One of the great difficulties of wandering around the world. I went to 12 schools. Before he came to the tower, Sir Roger was chief of the general staff of the armed forces. Now, he's the new boy at the tower. 93. 93? No, I was at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. Who were you? I have to tell you, I never went to Sandhurst. <laughs> Too good for that. <laughs> No. I was a leftover from a pre-war system and immediately after national service. They, I went, went up to Oxford University to read an arts degree and they suddenly thought, what do we do with this lot? And they sent me straight. I left Oxford on the 7th of August and I was commanding a platoon in Borneo, a rather surprised Ulster Rifleman, uh, <laughs> on the 14th. It'll be very different from uh, the direct command of a large number of soldiers. But I have the Yeoman Warders as uh, my command, although this is very much a, a ceremonial job, but um, the constable has a responsibility for what, after all, is a World Heritage Site. However, General Wheeler will not actually be in residence at the tower. For at least 500 years, the constable has had a right-hand man who has lived on site. Here at the Queen's House, Tower Green, the Tower of London. This is still the home address of the man in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the tower, the resident governor, Major General Geoffrey Field. We're in the Queen's House, which is the official residence of the governor of the tower. It used to be called the Lieutenant's Lodgings in, until about 1880, when the name changed with Queen Victoria's permission. And the name changes back and forward, so if there's a king on the throne, it becomes a king's house. Queen on the throne, it's, it's the Queen's house. It was built in 1540 on the site of an earlier medieval house. If you look from the outside of the house, you can see um, a typical Tudor frame building. But every governor lives in this house with his family, which is a great privilege, really. It's a fantastic house. As you can see, it's got a most amazing view of the Thames and Tower Bridge and HMS Belfast on that side. And then, of course, you look on the other side, you've got the White Tower and the whole of the Tower of London. Inside the governor's home hangs a portrait of a legendary predecessor. Sir James Robinson. He was also the Lord Mayor of London in 1662. And it was uh, Robinson who was nicknamed Jack Robinson. You've heard the expression before you can say Jack Robinson. And I think that stems from the fact that he was, uh, as Lord Mayor, in charge of the judiciary of the city. And as the constable, he was in, in charge of the state prison. 
So before you could say Jack Robinson, you'd be out of court and into the Tower of London uh, as quick as a flash. Whilst the constable is the tower's figurehead, the governor is in charge of practical matters. Um, can you give the jailer a ring right, and sir. let him know I'm back Certainly. and see him in a minute? Well, the governor's job, despite the slightly grandiose title, is very much being involved in running the business. I'm the, effectively the chief executive of a business which is the biggest uh, visitor attraction business in, in Britain, certainly the biggest historic attraction business. We turn over about £30 million a year, so it's a, you know, it's a serious business, and that is what 95% uh, of my time is taken up doing. 5% is taken up doing the, the twirly bits around the edge. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Hello, Mr. Garner. Yeah, sure. The governor shares the Queen's house with one of the most famous constables the Tower has ever had. A hero on the battlefield, twice Prime Minister, he still presides over the entrance hall, the Duke of Wellington. In 1826, a national hero became Constable of the Tower of London, the Duke of Wellington, the Iron Duke, who had defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. Wellington was still a highly influential figure when he came to the Tower 11 years later. This week, 21st century visitors can experience the time when Wellington reigned as Constable here. I'm playing uh, Martha Dean, who's... Uh, uh, the wife of a, a yeoman warder, and I would run a tea shop in the White Tower. Come inside the White Tower tea rooms for a nice cup of rosy lay. <laughs> One of the modern day yeoman warders is becoming a predecessor from Wellington's time. To get into his role, Alan Fiddes needs to don a set of 19th century whiskers. I suppose it's like babies and dogs, isn't it? They're all right as long as you can hand them back at the end of the day. That's right. <laughs> there you go. Okay, thank you. I actually love that the whole concept of the Victorian Tower of London. There were so many changes took place there over the hundred years. It was amazing. They had the Mint move out in 1810, the Menageries closed down move out in 1835, the Duke of Wellington becoming constable in 1826 and remaining so for 26 years. So much went on, it was unbelievable. One of Wellington's early changes was to reform the Yeoman Warders. He started a system that still exists today. When Wellington arrived, Warders could sell their jobs to whoever they liked when they retired. The Iron Duke changed all that. He decreed that warders should be chosen from deserving, gallant, meritorious sergeants discharged from the army. The tower became full of warders with military records. And you've got all these young warders with masses of medals from all these various campaigns. The medals I've got on here at the moment are actually genuine medals. The Prince of War, four bars, four different battles. The Battle of Waterloo and the Long Service and Good Conduct Medal. Genuine medals, £3,000. Borrowed, it must be said, not mine. When Wellington took over at the Tower, he discovered a place that had hardly changed from medieval times. It was typified by this Victorian model made in 1841. In the course of making this model, what the Royal Engineers managed to do was capture uh, the Tower of London in a form which the Tower had always represented for hundreds of years prior to this, a densely packed fortress full of properties occupied by people of all different walks of life, full of sort of people doing all sorts of trades from cigar making, brick making, you name it, they were here. But Wellington wanted the tower to be a well-organised military base and began a mass clear-out. Within a short space of time, all the inns and the shops were being closed down and the people were being moved out and the sort of sanitisation of the Tower of London was under, underway. And when you look at the Tower of London now and you look in the outer wards and you see these clear, uncluttered views, these vistas that never existed, in a former time, you, you know, you realise just how far removed this sort of world was from the one that we occupy and the one that was about to be sprung on the tower. As constable, Wellington presided over the tower being turned into an efficient military installation, clearing away the higgledy-piggledy old buildings, putting up brand new Victorian Gothic-style barracks 
removing the menagerie and draining the moat outside the walls which no longer had much defensive value and had become a stinking health hazard. Tucked away in the Royal Armoury's tower storeroom are some remarkable objects, including Wellington's death mask and some of his personal possessions. I have something in here of interest uh, as regards the Duke of Wellington. And that's uh, his official jacket as Constable of the Tower of London. The thing that always struck me and strikes most people are the buttons. These brass buttons, and on the sleeves as well, bear the white tower. He was a great figurehead and, and, and just the sort of person who should fill the post of Constable of the Tower of London. And I interesting to point out, I mean, once he was made Constable, I mean, he didn't lose the post until he died. He involved himself in all aspects of the Tower life. So if you needed something doing at the Tower of London, you really did need the constable's approval. But Wellington couldn't control everything. More visitors were coming to the Tower. I'm going to be a tourist. No, we'd all like to see the place of execution. Maybe we could have an execution. That would be fun. Wellington hated tourists. They didn't fit in with his plans for military precision. But public opinion was putting the tower under financial and political pressure to let in more visitors. This was one battle Wellington couldn't win. When they reformed the entry fees in 1838 so people could come in at a lower price uh, with proper tickets and guidebooks and so forth, that was actually done without his approval. And as far as I know, the constable read about it in the daily papers. And I'm sure he, he took exception to it. Um, his view was that uh, basically the public in, in the Tower of London was not something he wanted to encourage. He, he, he thought they got in the way of things. Wellington also feared that the rabble of London could storm the armories and run riot. But he failed to stem the tide and formal arrangements for visitors were brought in. It was a huge success. In just three years, the number of tourists increased from 10,500 to 80,000 per year. The tower was well on its way to becoming the historic attraction it is today. But modern tourists will not be able to witness one of the tower's grandest ceremonial events firsthand. Numbers are limited at the forthcoming installation of the next constable of the tower. It's only open to specially invited guests. Planning is well underway. You can imagine that the culmination of five months' work with just six days to go, it's all building up. We're bringing together all the threads, bringing all the soldiers together, the bands, the stands are going up. We've got about uh, 750 guests descending on the tower. Right, gents. Call in, please. Coordinating all that and the various receptions that go on is creating quite a lot of work. It's all being put together with military precision. What we did, we watched the video and we discovered that in 1996, one of the dignitaries completed the course from the house to the microphone in one minute and 51 seconds, the other in one minute and 17. So what we've done is we've said, right, give them a minute and a half. In charge so of the parade is Garrison well Sergeant Major Perry Mason. The only thing I'd like to say about the timings is that what we're trying to achieve is that at 1900 hours when the clock chimes is when the parade commander is given the word of command, Royal Salute present arms. This is why, so when we come to doing the rehearsal of the parade, we need someone with a watch. Drilling the troops to perfection is the job of the Garrison Sergeant Major. Major Jamie Hayward's main concern is almost everything else. Well, that's the Bible. That's all my refusals and all my responses. All to the... Well, we sent out about a thousand invitations, I suppose, in the first place. And, um, as I say, we're going to be about 750 on the night of invited guests. You're going to form two on the as Garrison Sergeant Major for London, 
Perry Mason also takes charge of the Queen's birthday parade. The part of the parade I'm least worried about is the actual parade itself, because the Garrison Sergeant Major in London District has been running parades for 15, well, in London, 15 years, but for 35 odd years throughout his military career. This, I think, will be his third installation. And I have absolute faith in the Garrison Sergeant Major that the parade itself will go without a hiccup. Work form, two racks. Form, two racks. Left, right, left. One of the main challenges is to synchronise drill between regular and reserve troops coming from across Europe. We've got um, a Guard of Honour coming from Ireland, a Guard of Honour coming from Germany. We've got a Guard of Honour here. So the three Guards are all coming from various different parts and then he has to bring them together. They've never worked together before. Get an arms interval from the right! Right! Fill over! Give us a loop! Hours more practice are needed to reach the standard of drill required by the Garrison Sergeant Major. The aim of drill is to provide a soldier who's smart, obedient and alert and to form the basis for all teamwork. And I'm a great believer if you get it right on the barrack square, you'll get it right at war and in all conflict. But is there any point in a ceremonial event like the constable's installation? It would be only too easy to say, well, it's all a bit of a, um, a performance. It's, it's costing money, you're building stands, you're bringing units back from Germany. Yeah, I can see that. But on the other hand, it's very easy to say, well, well, we'll not do it. And then if you don't do it this time round, that's it, it's gone forever. The man who will be at the centre of events is General Wheeler. I am looking forward to it. Uh, it's a very special parade. I suppose it would be fair to say that it's unique. Everything has to be practised to a strict timetable. So the top brass rehearsal must carry on regardless. No one can stand down until the Garrison Sergeant Major says so. Always better to have it wet on the rehearsal. You must stop me at 1855, 30 seconds. Right, I'll give you a 10 uh, second warning before yeah. 1855 yeah. and a half. It'll be all right on the night. Padre's here. <laughs> he never fails. We've got good communication with him upstairs. In just two days' time, after months of preparation, the tower will be holding a ceremony that has never been seen outside these walls before. We are D minus one, and, um, and the, the clock is ticking. Pipes and drum of the Royal Irish Regiment. Four minutes, 45 seconds. There are a lot of last minute, uh, m quite minor things to be picked up. Elizabeth II, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom, the great Britain... Endless telephone calls about so-and-so's personal protection officer needs to come and look at the ground. You think, well, why didn't they do that three weeks ago? And, you know, so minor irritations like that. ...subject as aforesaid the yeoman warders are a fixture at all tower events. March in in a line on George, shoulder. Even though the ceremony is taking place just a few yards from their front doors, these old soldiers still have to rehearse. The black squares are actually where they have to stand, which should be rather interesting when it gets a bit dark later on whether or not they will see the, the squares. As they you ever, you. ever find a soldier who doesn't look down to see where That's he's supposed to be, ever. that'll be a miracle because no, they no, always no. look down to see Thank where they're going. No. It's part of the military training to be surreptitious. I'm sorry, ma'am, the wharf is closed now. 
Apart from Christmas Day, the Tower of London only closes once every five years. Today's that day. It's the new constable's installation parade. The task of clearing Tower Wharf is the responsibility of new yeoman warder Simon Dodd. Ladies, good afternoon. Could you please be aware that the tower is now closing? Good afternoon, ladies. Please be aware that the tower is now closing. Everybody has been cleared out of the whole of the inner ward of the tower. And then this is the final sweep with everybody coming out this way, out through the west gate and then out through the wicker gate. And then that's it, the tower is then closed and secured and back to being ours again. <laughs> Our small village community. I'm not going to put you in charge of the skipping rope again, Rod. There's just time for a last-minute <laughs> refinement to help the parade markers show up in the dark. The parade is now only two hours away. Everyone is getting ready for this private ceremony, the installation of the 158th Constable of the Tower since the time of William the Conqueror. Simon Dodd is being helped by his wife Pauline to get into state dress. Is that tight enough? It's going to be his first ceremonial occasion as a yeoman warder. I do feel, I, I do feel very proud to be in this. It's, it's good. Yeah. It's a very smart uniform. I think someone wrote, it's like you know, like a playing card come alive. When you think about it, there's only 40 people in the whole world, probably, that wear this now. Yeah that are full-time yeoman warders, isn't it? There's 40. That's mm. it. That's amazing. Further down Mint Street, Garrison Sergeant Major Perry Mason is getting ready too. I'm, a, I'm looking forward to the parade, of course. I mean, yeah, the old adrenaline's flowing. I'm sure that everyone on parade uh, will be looking forward to uh, being on parade. Uh, things don't go uh, right. People are saying, Sergeant Major, what went wrong there? Um, but I think you'll find this evening it'll be a very, very good parade. The troops now arriving will be parading on Tower Green to a step set by the Garrison Sergeant Major's pace stick. <clears throat> the pace stick is an aid to drill. So this opens and it's got a bar there. And on that bar are certain measurements. And there's 30 inches, which is the normal marching pace. And then the final setting is that of 33, which is stepping out. It can also, as you may, may you want to have seen on Monday, it can be used perhaps for injecting enthusiasm into idle sort of soldiers. Not that someone in my position would do such a thing. And I, th I think it's like everything else. On Monday when you saw the rehearsal, they were in number eight dress, what you might know as combat clothing. But this evening, all the soldiers on parade are going to be in their best sort of like uniform. And I think once they get their uniforms on, their medals and, uh, you know, They'll pull their tummies in, stick their chests out, and I'm sure when they get f that first word of command, the old hairs on the neck will stand on end, perhaps be a shiver down the back, and that's pride. I don't want to give away too many secrets, but it was timed, obviously, when we did it on Monday evening. Those times have been recorded. Um, and hopefully they'll achieve at those same timings this evening. But I'm giving a little bit of mystique now, aren't I telling you things like that? <laughs> Shouldn't be doing that. Right, come on, knock up. Time to go and play. Just half an hour until start time. Once the troops are on parade, they are out of the garrison sergeant major's control. Where, where's actually your first two men at? They will be roughly in line with the end of the western steps. Where is there, is there any chance of uh, putting... This is his last opportunity for final adjustments and to get everyone in the right frame of mind. General Slate! No, let's make it a royal. Royal salute. I want to shiver down your back, get the adrenaline going. Here we go. Royal salute! Present! Perfectly still. You've got to cut about the right and left guys. Straight, slow. Out. 
still. Stand back! Hey! Stand! Easy! Right, well done. Look this way, look this way. Right, enough from me. Work hard, give them your best, and let's have a good installation this evening. What's happening now, Sam Smith? 23 minutes past, sir. What? 23 minutes past, sir. What time should the band go? 23 minutes past, sir. I'm growing. There's no pipes. Right. I'm gonna put a tail on me. General Sir Roger Wheeler is taking over one of the most famous historic institutions in the world. Within yards of Tower Green, the nation's history has been played out. Here, Queen Anne Boleyn was executed, Guy Fawkes interrogated, and the princes in the tower murdered. This is where William the Conqueror founded his fortress palace over 900 years ago. Edward I built the ultimate castle, and Elizabeth I was imprisoned. German waters, Edwards, tank! The tower has played a part in virtually every moment in Britain's history. Once, this was a national powerhouse. Today, its role is symbolic. The latest chapter in the tower's history is about to start. General Sir Roger Wheeler, in the Queen's name and on Her Majesty's behalf, I deliver to you the keys and custody of the Royal Palace and Fortress of the Tower of London. Lord Chamberlain, I accept these keys and the custody of this fortress. In the Queen's name, you have confided to me. I shall maintain Her Majesty's Tower, its rights and privileges against all comers. <laughs> 